hand center this. So um, just a little bit about me. I've been an IBU volunteer since 2014. Um, I've done seven trips to Uganda. Um, and I think, and then I joined the board in 2019. Um, I'm actually a community urologist, which is um, kind of the minority as far as the volunteers in IBU Med. Most of them are um, are you, you, at the at universities or fellowship trained. Um, but I think, you know, in this case, I've filled a good role because the practice where Fred is, is was kind of uh, a little bit, you know, not, a, not as mature and they were more interested in learning things like TERPs and TURBTs and honestly, you know, basic general urology and started out by going there, like I said, in 2014 and sort of evaluating their needs and we were actually able to get them some uh, a pretty significant donation from Stewart's. So they have like a full resection set, including this thing called a telepack, which is really ideal for there because there's not a lot of moving parts to it. And it's this integrated uh, monitor, um, light source and camera, camera uh, uh, deck. And so it's easy to move around. And the other thing so that Fred and I have started doing is actually um, where there's actually no urology in Western Uganda, uh, we've started doing camps there as well. So I'll usually do a week with Fred in his practice in Mbali, and then we usually go over to um, Fort Portal and uh, work there. And so uh, it's been kind of a, a, a nice partnership. So uh, with that, I'll start going. Um, so, um, you know, as far as why volunteer, there's numerous reasons to want to volunteer. We want to give something back, pay forward, uh, more to work than just driving the kid, you know, kids to soccer or lowering the golf handicap, <laughs> sarcasm. But, uh, but the biggest thing is that we can do, and especially with IV Med, is we want to share our knowledge and experience with international colleagues. Um, and, and, and it really helps you grow professionally. Uh, I, you know, it, it sounds a little bit of a cliche, but it's 100% true. Um, I've learned just as much from my time there and from Fred as they have from me. And it really does make you appreciate things from when you get home. You know, you see what they're working with, maybe six or eight different suture options. And then you see this, you know, literally 300 different permutations of suture options that, you know, that we have at our hospital. And so, you know, you appreciate what you have. And it also kind of makes you better at improvising and when things don't quite go right at your home institution, you're, you know, you've, you've learned to become more flexible. So in addition to the obvious, you know, giving back, it, it, it actually makes you a better uh, physician when you come home and when you continue your practice. And um, it just, it really gives you that, you know, why you went into medicine in the first place. It really helps restore that and maintain that. Um, so, you know, as far, there's different types of uh, volunteer opportunities. Uh, traditionally, there's been, you know, long-term placements like things like Peace Corps and Doctors Without Borders, uh, health volunteers overseas. Uh, there's also some fixed facilities that are often faith-based, but not always. And what they'll do is rotate uh, providers through. Um, but interested in, interest has really grown over the last uh, several years. And you know, increasing globalization and flow of information has uh, raised people's interest in trying to volunteer over uh, our time. And um, and but realistically, you know, those of us have full time practices or people like Colton who are in medical school and then seem to be in residency. You know, that's not a realistic thing that they can give even six months. So, you know, these short term medical uh, trips are, are, are what are more common. And so the question is, you know, what's the best way to do those? Um, I need to figure out how to move this. Okay, there we go. So goals, um, you know, and this really, we'll talk a little bit about IV Med's mission and more specifically about the Teach One, Reach Many. Um, but you want to aid and focus on development on increasing the local skills those providers and developing their capacity. Um, 
you know, the goal should be that eventually there's no need for me to go back to Uganda or I go back there as more of a social visit. You know, that, that, that should be what you have in mind, not some sustained, I'm going to come back for two weeks a year and sort of try and, you know, plug the dam kind of thing. You know, your goal should be that these people eventually don't need me. And maybe even then they come here and teach us a few things. Um, so, you know, where exactly, you know, we're recurring medical conditions or redundancy. And, you know, we really want to emphasize broad global health competencies. And I think that's actually, Patrick, uh, a lot of what your uh, organization is, is striving for. So, um, which is why I think there's a lot of synergy between what we do and you do. Um, you know, there's ethical considerations. You know, we're here, we bring a team of foreign doctors into a community. Uh, there can be traditional principles that conflict with Western medicine, such as uh, things like cutting or female genital mutilation. And, you know, you don't want to undermine their, uh, you know, their, in, like, for instance, in Uganda, while they're severely under-resourced and severely understaffed, they do have an established urologic community and, and you don't want to go in there and undermine that. And that's, and it's impossible to overestimate the, you know, what the, authority, you know, what, how they view you as a Western trained physician and the impact you can have and, and how that can be abused. And so you really need to respect their culture, respect their autonomy. And, um, and, and that's why I think what we do with the partnership where we work with local urologists is, is key. Um, Cause there, there, there's things I miss even, even going back, even having been there seven times, there's things I miss without Fred there and his colleagues that uh, just really facilitate the, the, the cultural care, not just the medical care. Um, and I'll show you a picture later that'll really emphasize that. <laughs> okay. Um, and so you want to integrate within their local infrastructure. You don't want to undermine, I already said this, the local providers. Um, and then you want to, foreign learners may take away opportunities for local. So that, what that refers to is when we bring residents along. And so we don't want it, when we bring residents along, we really emphasize that they're mostly there in an observational capacity and help out what they can do. Um, and, you know, we don't want to, because we are limited in the number of cases we can do, you know, the goal is for the, the local physicians, either board certified or, or their trainees to be the to take the key lead role. Um, you don't want to exploit the community as a learning center. Uh, that's something that has been done over and over um, with medical volunteers where we people, we will go there, not we necessarily, not us, but different organizations will go there. They'll, they'll well-meaning and they'll bring residents and trainees and, you know, essentially exploit these people as learning opportunities. And that's, you know, that's, that's just ethically not okay. Um, and then there's a continuing need for foreign dependents and medical aid. So uh, we, we brought equipment there um, and we want to, but, but our goal is again, to get them to be self-sufficient. Oh, this is Dr. Kiria. I think he's coming in. Do I have to admit him or do you? Okay, there he is, sorry. I'm not good at this. So. <laughs> Um, so I'll wait before I get started and can you hear us, Fred? There he is. So Fred, I got started a little bit with the lecture, if you can hear me. Does anyone, can you, can you, does anyone hear him? I can't hear him. Looks like he's saying something. We can't hear you, Fred. Okay, <laughs> hi. Um, okay. And uh, and I told these guys, uh, um, the other participants, um, hang on a second, I have to check this to make sure that's not them. I may need to do, I have a, um, have to do a procedure, just a quick cystoscopy. So I'll be interrupted for a few minutes and um, Katie will, present the IVU med video and it'll give you an opportunity to talk as well. Um, but I'll just, so with that in mind, I'll keep going. So 
short-term medical missions and endeavors, which we've kind of been referring to. Uh, so typical two to four weeks, um, there's the, what's called the surgical brigade, which uh, kind of the antithesis of we, what we are at IVU Med. Um, things like other opportunities of local integration, disaster relief, and, uh, and then there's things like the Mercy Ship. Um, there's, uh, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with that, but that's, uh, it's basically literally a floating hospital um, that uh, provides medical care. Um, and actually just, uh, I was actually, I used to be in the military and um, the, the, the military used to do things like these, although they've kind of gotten away from that. Okay, with that, I just got called. I'm going to pause, okay? I'm going to go do this procedure and come back, okay? Do we want to, and then, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Is that okay, Katie? Yeah, I'll share the, I, the video that goes over IVU's work. Okay, do I have to unshare or do I have to do anything? I think that I can just boot you off. Okay, sounds good. Boot me off. <laughs> All right. Okay, so this is just a video that goes over what IVU does, um, and I think it gives a pretty good description of our work. Really gets you back to why you decided to go to medical school in the first place. What IVU Med does is organizes volunteer surgeons, urologists, to work in host countries that are usually developing countries and educate in-country surgeons or urologists in whatever their area of expertise is. It started because of the need for doing urologic care worldwide. In Africa, there's about a billion people. And there's less than a thousand urologists. In the United States, there's 300 million people and 11,000 urologists. So our goal is to go in and train them on how to do reconstructive go to areas where the surgeons have the skill sets, but maybe not have the opportunities to train with people who are more focused in certain areas so they get specialized training. Going to a new site is both fascinating and invigorating because you meet new friends and partners. The world of urology and urologic surgery, there's a bit of a kinship around the globe where even if you've never met with someone, you spend your working hours doing the same thing. And so there's a common language. And even if there's language barriers, there's common techniques and bonding that takes place. This can be a process where IVU Med comes every six months, going over the same types of surgeries until the local surgeons feel competent that they can perform these surgeries on their own. Some of the things that I've learned is that the people that you're training are as good as you are. They just haven't seen the types of surgeries that you do every day. So they quickly become as good or if not better than you. Surgical care in of itself is actually a very cost efficient way of providing medical care. A lot of the resources we bring them are donated. So it's a, a lot of return on investment for any money that goes towards the organization. The exponential growth of being able to help the surgeons help their patients after you leave uh, attaches a lot of meaning to going on these trips. If people want to improve the overall healthcare quality in some of these resource poor nations, helping us go there and teach is critical. We've gone from a few trips a year to 25 plus trips a year. The impact is growing. The specialties are growing. I'm thrilled with what we've been able to do. I think we'll set up more centers of excellence. I think we'll expand into global research and doing uh, projects which will show our outcome. And by us going and giving back, we actually are able to give them their life back, but also give the surgeons opportunity to help more people. A simple smile, a thank you in another language, and just knowing that in some way we may have helped an individual out who didn't have access to care. It's really in its purest form what most of us went into healthcare and medicine and surgery for, is meeting people that benefit from your services while also spreading the mission and spreading educational opportunities and trying to expand the quality of care in places where there's certainly a need for improvement.
Um, yeah, so I think that video gives a good overview. Um, Ivy has been around for 26 years now. That video is one year old. And throughout its entire history, the whole focus has been on teaching as opposed to just going and doing. And the whole focus is creating sustainable training networks so that you know, surgeons like Dr. Kiria and his colleagues know how to do um, all the surgeries themselves and they're not relying on any US doctors because they are incredibly qualified and intelligent surgeons. All they need is some training that maybe they don't have there. And because we've been around for 26 years now, we've been able to create long-term partnerships where we send kind of a core team, at least the same team leader to the site every single year, sometimes multiple times a year, just to establish a relationship and to keep building upon what they've been taught every single uh, workshop. And I'm not sure if your microphone is working, Dr. Kiria, but if it is, I wonder if it might be nice for you to talk about your involvement of you and how you got involved. Hello. Good evening, all. Whether I'm clear, hello, hello. Okay, now we can hear you. Hi, Dr. Carrier, we can hear you hello? again. Hello, how are you? <laughs> We're all good, thank you, how are you? Greetings to Patrick, Kati, Eric, Colton, Mohammed. Yes, I've met uh, Sam, I'm yet to meet others, it's nice talking to you, I somehow got problems with my internet connectivity and I've had to put my video off so you could just hear the voice. Yes, IVU has been very instrumental in improving the quality of surgical care in Uganda and we have worked together for over 10 years with IVU. At present, just before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been working with Eric and the other urologists from the United States who have visited us at our hospital in Eastern Uganda regularly. And we have worked not only in Eastern Uganda, but also in Western Uganda. And in doing this, IVU has done skills transfer and technology transfer. And with the help of other people like Carl Stores and other friends, we have actually improved on the quality of care of our patients in urology in Eastern Uganda and parts of Western Uganda. And in doing this, we have also improved on the human resource skills in Eastern Uganda. At least four surgeons have been trained. Two of them are very active with me and more were awaiting training just before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Last year, because of the pandemic, we were not able to have any camp, but we have continued to work. And even amidst the, the pandemic, we have been attending very educative lectures organized by IVU with colleagues from Uganda and in the USA. So I must say, it's been a very wonderful experience working with IVU and Eric. And we have a bigger dream that it's not just that we are offering a service to the patients, we actually would like to train more and more urologists. If we could be a training center, it's our dream that would even be better. 
and we look forward to continuing this work with the COVID-19 pandemic being brought under control. So I'm happy to join you tonight in this very important conversation. For now, let me pause my conversation. All right. So one of my least favorite things to do in life is start talking after Fred has spoken because I would never sound nearly as eloquent. And, <laughs> and I think we finally made the rule that when we, because we usually do some sort of wrap up after the camp is I, I, we finally made the rule that I go first and I don't have to follow Fred because you who, man, he's, he's good. <laughs> I'm but, sorry, I came before you, I didn't know. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. So no, it's good. It's it's good. So and I appreciate that. And so, uh, but with that, I'll, I'll continue with the <clears throat> with the slides. Um, so I probably need to share again, huh, Katie? Yeah. Yeah, and thank you for sharing all of that, Dr. Kiria. Yeah. No, it really, it really, you know, just I think it emphasizes the. The, the partnership um, that, that, that we have. And, um, you know, we, we started out as you know, colleagues and, you know, I, I, and I'm sure Fred would agree, but, uh, you know, he's at this point, he's one of my best friends in this world. And, um, and so it's, um, it's been, it's, there's, it just speaks to the, I think the, the benefits and the way we do things and, 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 and allows us to get on the same page and, and really make a difference. So, um, but so surgical brigade, this is kind of um, sort of the antithesis of what we I think frown upon for lack of a better word at IBM med, but this is, you know, and this isn't just surgery, this can appear, this can apply to non-surgical endeavors, but basically, you know, this is where we have a, you know, a large group of most often Western, either European, U.S., Canadian group comes and uh, basically sets up uh, a freestanding operating room and comes and does many cases. Um, they may utilize an existing operating room in a resource poor area. That's what RPA stands for, by the way, um, such as, you know, often of a faith-based uh, institution where they can sometimes sort of set, set up their own. Um, and it basically their goal is to maintain advanced operative standards using, the, but they're using the volunteers team's personnel, the volunteer term team's equipment and supplies. And while there are many operations performed with direct benefit to individual patients, um, there are some uh, untoward uh, costs associated with this. Um, typically, teaching low local personnel is a low priority. Oftentimes, there's not a counterpart. So um, at IVU Med, we never do a case without a local urologist. You know, that's just, you know, that, and um, they're also very costly and resource intense, and it puts a large footprint on a resource poor area. Um, so you know, it disrupts normal patterns of activity and it doesn't allow for ongoing care for chronic issues. Um, you know, just as an aside, uh, in addition to cases, I'll actually see clinic together with Fred. Uh, so we'll actually see just, you know, what regular everyday urology clinic and we'll do that together and, you know, bounce things off each other. And, and again, we, we both learn and it, and, it, and it benefits the patient. So it's not so it's, it's a, and that's the, hopefully the thing we're emphasizing over and over is just the long-term benefit. Um, and so these are sort of the unintended consequences of the brigade. Um, oftentimes the care team is not matched to the local needs. So if you're not working with you know, someone local who can, you can say in advance, I can say, Dr. Curia, what are, what are the cases you plan on doing? What is it you want to do? And um, you know, they, and, 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 and he directs that or, or, or his equivalent somewhere else. And so sometimes we'll bring in a pediatric team. Sometimes we'll bring in a reconstruction team. And so the cases are matched to the personnel. It's not and it, based on the direction of the local urologist in the local hospital. 
And so when you bring, and so the other unintended consequence, you bring in a large team, things need to be sterilized and, and you can quickly exhaust their sterile supplies and other disposables. And, you know, they're gracious people and appreciative. So they're not gonna tell you that, oh, by the way, now you left us with no supplies for us to, to bear what we can, as it is, we're barely carrying out our mission. Um, these areas are staffed for their typical needs and then all of a sudden you overflow their wards and it's a and, and it's a strain on their personnel and then of course they can't do things like emergency cases and then daily operations are compromised so um, and then we talked about this earlier undermining local providers so you know if I come in just by myself you know the they'll say, oh, well, why, why am I going to go to Dr. Curia when I can go to this person from the U.S.? And, and it undermines him. But when we work together, it enhances his practice. It enhances his standing. And as it should, because these people are excellent urologists. Um, and so, again, we're diverting patients from local practitioners. And so uh, there's an economic de detriment and some perceived competence detriment. And so you can acquire disproportionate political influence over local health policies. And, and, and that cannot be understated what, 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 that, what that can do. Um, so another thing is so if we go in and start doing cases, it, 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 it removes the incentive for the government to invest in healthcare. So if they know, you know every X number of weeks, this team from the US or Canada or England is gonna come in, you know, why should they invest in, in care? But if we're doing it in coordination and we can say, hey, this is what we think the needs are, we at least have a fighting chance of working with them. Um, and again, if, if people know free treatment is coming, they'll wait for the next group to arrive before uh, supporting the, the local medical care, the local medical community rather, sorry. And so it erodes the initiative to seek care that already exists in the communities oftentimes. So, and this is, this can't be understated also follow up. So oftentimes when these so-called surgical brigades go in, they'll say, okay, who's gonna do the follow up? And they may coordinate with, a, with our equivalent of maybe a physician assistant, maybe a, a general practitioner. Um, and you go there expecting to do the cases and say, okay, I'll do this. And then this person will follow, follow them up. Number one, oftentimes when, the visiting team leaves the people who agreed to they're, they're busy they've got other things to do and so they may not follow up on those and then there's a competency i think you know like especially in urology but in, in any specialty we're doing complicated cases and you know i know that if i leave and do a case fred is available or his, or his colleagues are available those patients are going to get the appropriate follow-up um, from a urologist from a competent skilled urologist, not, uh, not a physician assistant, not a general practitioner, and someone who's participated in the care and who's invested in the care. So they're gonna, you, you can feel good that the patients are gonna get the, the right care. And you know, we all know, despite best intentions, complications happen in surgery. They just do. Uh, to the, from the most inexperienced of surgeons to the most experienced, complications happen. You, know, you operate enough, there's going to be complications. And to expect that that's not going to happen when you go to a resource poor environment and you're doing more cases than you're even used to, that's probably even more likely to occur. Um, so again, the surgical brigade, no, no sustainable benefit, no development of local healthcare capacity. It may feel good, but it doesn't solve the underlying problem. And you know, this is kind of the question we ask. So sure, you do 20 to 40, maybe even 100 cases, but in a country like Uganda with 40 million or maybe even bigger population at this point, that's not really moving the needle in any significant amount. Um, it doesn't address the root cause and, it, and, and, and there's no long-term gain. So local integration, volunteers can settle swiftly, contribution typically used to free up local staff. Um, you want to reduce local and language barriers, requires close collaboration. Um, and uh, I'm going to continue reading, but like we really want to 
your mission should be sustainable and capacity building. And I think that's the big, big takeaway. Um, so other keys, uh, sustainable clinical care that addresses the community priorities. So directed by the nation you're going to, not by what you perceive partner with the community, working with existing medical and public infrastructure. So we always go to, not just in Uganda, but wherever we go, we're going to the local hospital where urology care is being done, not another facility. Uh, sometimes it does help to cooperate with local NGOs um, and support uh, public, public health initiatives. Um, and you wanna educate participants before the trip begins. So short-term trip, long-term commitment. So just a short thing about donations. Um, I've seen this more commonly I, when I was actually deployed to a country called Djibouti, which is in Eastern Africa for six months when I was in the army. And there's a lot of well-meaning people that um, donate equipment and and supplies, and it's and, and literally it's you know littered with non-functioning medical equipment. Uh, and a simple thing, when I was in Djibouti, I remember there was a do, an, MRI, an MRI machine or a CT, I can't remember MRI or CT that was donated by uh, the Egyptian government, and they were missing literally like a light bulb or some probably two dollar part. But the thing was down for almost the entirety of my six months there. And so if they don't have the capability to fix it or repair it. Uh, themselves, it's not useful and often will exhaust the resources. Um, so we, as I alluded to earlier, we were able to get a donation from Storts. Um, I, Fred and I discussed what their needs were and he had the, he had say in what the donation was, he had not say, he had large input into what the donation was, what the needs were, and that's what we did. Um, and also, did contribute financially from their group. So they had uh, buy-in, um, you know, so that's important. And then the facility largely has the technical expertise to use, repair and replace if needed. And that's critical. All right, so ID Met. So this is what we do. Our, uh, our, 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 our mantra, teach one, reach many. So the idea is that, you know, rather than doing 40, 20, whatever number of cases you do, um, we wanna, by teaching Fred or teaching his colleagues, wherever it is, we can reach many because then the other 50 weeks a year that we're not there, he's then hopefully imparting some of the knowledge that we share with him and some of the just basic practice logistics. So um, it's more of a minimalist approach as far as personnel. Uh, there's Sometimes it's just a single urologist, sometimes a urologist and a resident. Uh, more recently, we'll come with an anesthesiologist and sometimes a nurse. So we're usually look, talking between, an, an average team is about th between three and six people. Some of the pediatric teams may come with a few more people just by the nature of what they're doing. Um, but it's a small, small team, so it's small footprint, low impact and cost with the emphasis on education. And as I said, sometimes we'll bring nurses because our emphasis is on teaching. And so the nurses that we bring, uh, uh, so we a uh, nurse named Renee came with me on one of the first trips and, and she worked with her equivalents and taught and just some of the logistics and, and what we do in perioperative care. And so this is the sustainable benefit. Um, again, we assess the needs of the host urologist in advance. Uh, so whether they're fellowship trained or general urologists, what they and it's and what they need, what they want, not what we can, what we want. We learn the supplies and equipment, and discuss in advance what they can use and what they will be um, what will benefit from most from. And so, if we continue to go to the same place, continue to use the same equipment, that breeds familiarization and optimization of the use of the equipment. Um, so objectives, uh, surgical procedures, and CME, this is something that we're doing a lot more of uh, recently, especially in the pandemic, which Dr. Kiria uh, referred to as what we call the visiting virtual professor. 
And so these groups have the opportunity to request a specific topic. Katie uh, will usually then organize it and uh, find an appropriate presenter and, um, and and coordinate the lecture. And how many have we done in the last year, Katie? I think somewhere around 50. So uh, quite a bit and um, probably reached thousands of people at this point through through those collectively. Yeah. Um, and, and we'll talk about things like operating room and patient care efficiency, and that's where the nurses come in. Uh, we, I remember just talking to Fred, uh, Dr. Dr. Carey, about surgical cards. Uh, we're doing research now. Uh, we have a research committee, and we're working with projects uh, in a wide range of areas. Uh, the education of local nurses and then resident involvement. And our goal is resident involvement, again, isn't as a as a as a necessarily surgical teaching for them, but it's to create awareness and interest in global medicine. So our goal is to teach as we treat patients. Uh, the local surgeons gain experience. Uh, patients are served, and they teach their peers, and that's the reach one, teach many, uh, teach new approaches, improve access to healthcare, and then increase capacity. Um, and oftentimes, hosts. Like Dr. Curia, they're they're not necessarily they're just seeking validation and confidence. Um, a lot of you know, as I said, I learn more from him and his colleagues than he does from me. And, and again, that's not just cliche; that's one hundred percent the truth. And so, oftentimes, it just you know, he's you know, we have the benefit of partners and running things off of people and reaching out to our mentors that he doesn't have that uh, in our host nation. Neurologists don't have that opportunity. So just, uh, just the, the simple uh, opportunity to say, okay, yeah, this is how I do it and I'm doing it right and, and keep going and just in that, in, that, that increases confidence. And so this is why we try and work with the same group, same place. Um, IV Med, so like I said, I've gone to Uganda every time and that's where I'll continue to go. And there's, and so it shouldn't be what we call medical tourism where I go to Uganda and next time I go to Rwanda and then I go to Ecuador. It's, it's working with the same, you know, once you find a good fit, work with the same team. And that's how we, and it's an exponential increase in value with each trip, learning what their needs are, learning what equipment uh, they need, what we can bring each time and, and, and just really growing that partnership and the, and the friendship. Um, so because I had Dr. Curia there, the cultural and language barriers are reduced, never eliminated, but reduced. Uh, Dr. Curia always prepares the cases. Uh, expert follow-up is assured and it improves medical and surgical outcomes. Um, and so at IBU Med, we don't measure a number of cases. But so we always ask, so one of the things that's on the questionnaire when we return is how many personnel were trained how many doctors were trained, how many nurses were trained, how many techs were trained. And that's how we measure our success. It's not the number of cases, but it's the number of people we trained. And that can't be overemphasized. So there are obviously disadvantages to our pro approach um, because we're teaching, there, we're not, we perform less surgeries. Uh, certainly if I came there and did all the TURPs, we'd probably be able to do more cases, but that's not the goal. But because we worked together and taught Dr. Curia and he's taught other people, now more TURPs are being done. And probably, uh, and Dr. Curia can speak to this, but I would imagine the percentage of open prostatectomies versus endoscopic has been significantly reduced as a result. Um, and so when we're, because we're working in their facilities with their conditions, sometimes you don't have everything available that you're used to at your home institution. Maybe the operating rooms are, are lights are dim. Maybe there's power failures, non-functional suction machines and cauteries. So uh, the sterility of equipment, it's, it's a little bit different, but we're dependent on their host personnel and support. And, 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 and while I'm listing these, listing these as disadvantages to an extent there, these are advantages because we're working within their system to allow that system to grow and increase in capacity. And as I said, these are the things that make me better when I come back to Colorado. 
because I am working in these conditions and, and you realize it can be done. And it's, and it's exciting. It's, it's great. It's, 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 it's great. So just a little bit about, about Uganda. Um, and I'm going to show some pictures after this. It's called the Pearl of Africa. Uh, it's a really a, a beautiful country. Um, and as I said, this, the just warm, kind, welcoming people. And some of these, uh, and not only Dr. Kiria, but some of his colleagues and others I've met, are, they become friends for life. Um, and, 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 and I can't underestimate these, the, the surgeons are so talented. Um, they, they could, we, I could easily benefit from having Dr. Kiria come and show us things here in Colorado. Uh, and, and, and it's even more humbling when you realize the complicated surgeries they do with suboptimal instruments and, and, a, and, a, and a much less choice of sutures. And, and you don't have that perfect needle that you have here in the United States, you know, may do with a CT1 instead of an RB and, <laughs> you know, they make it happen where we can't. And so that's where it's located on a map. Um, I'm just going to run through some pictures just to see. This is outside of Mount Elgon Hospital, and that's the, the very base of Mount Elgon in the, in the shadow. Uh, this is Mbali, which is the uh, where Mount Elgon Hospital is, where Dr. Curie was based. Another picture. That's the town. This is a, well, I guess you, you guys will call it football too, but we call it soccer in the United States, but football match that, that we watch, which is a lot of fun. And then uh, it is the source of the Nile, which is kind of neat to see. It's the, the, the very beginning of the Nile River as it leaves Lake Victoria. Some other pictures. There's especially one I want to get to that. And then there's uh, me with the team. Um, this is a surgical, this is a resident that came with me. Um, so that's me, Dr. Kiria. And then that's Renee. She's one of the nurses that came with me on a trip. That's the floor, that's the ward where we're we rounding. Operating room. Um, there's our irrigation, <laughs> as you can see from when we do our TORPs. That's and, and, and you just got to set things up and, and make things happen, and and they do. And, and uh, the casualty ward, which is the emergency room. So this is uh, um, a resident that came with me on a trip. And again, the emphasis is on teaching. So this is just uh, her, she's giving a lecture on, I think it was bladder cancer. Um, and she's actually uh, fellowship trained now. Um, but uh, she came when she was, I think a fifth year resident. She came twice actually. So the picture. And that's the telepack in the background. Um, and so in between Dr. Curie and I, that's the, it's, it's the integrated light source, camera box and monitor. And it's really ideal for, you know, the, the lot less, it's not the perfect image, but it's, it's a nice image and it's really ideal because, you know, there's a lot less parts, a lot less things that can go wrong. And so I, I think it, it suits their needs and it's also very portable, which allowed us to go to Fort Portal. Just cleaning instruments, just something you don't do back where I am, but, you know, to, to participate and you pitch in. The pediatric floor, here's the tray. This is the what I just kind of wanted to emphasize as far as uh, this is a spleen. And I'll, I'll never forget this because this man fell and Dr. Curious said, oh, we got to take this guy to, to explore him to, to take to the OR. And I was like, what? You know, just based on a fall. And, and you know, sh sure enough, this guy had this shattered spleen and this blood full of abdomen. And Dr. Curious got the spleen out in about 35 minutes or something ridiculously quick. <laughs> and um you know just something that you so it be and the issue is the malaria is very common and because of the malaria they get splenomegaly and, and abdominal trauma can lead to a shattered spleen and this is something that you know 100 percent i would have missed i would never have thought to take this but because dr curie understands the population where he works because of that he expeditiously 
took this patient to the operating room, got the spleen out and saved this person's life. And so it's just a, you know, so, and I think that's, those are some of the cult, not just cultural things that we can miss, but medical things we can miss by not working closely with our host partners. And this is an extreme example, but there's subtle, more uh, nuanced things that happen all the time that he recognizes and teaches me uh, about the, you know, but not just cultural, but just also medical things that are just different in this population. And, and I think and, and, and something I've appreciated and learned from and, and allows us to all be more effective. Um, sometimes it's again, resource poor environment. Sometimes you have to do two cases in one operating room. That's the theater outside of Mount Dalgon. So I'm just about ready to wrap this up. Um, this is something that's a little bit older, but I think applies uh, the sins of man humanitarian medicine. So you can leave a mess behind complications, uh, critical complex surgeries for, like Operation Smile. Um, and it's the term neocolonialism. It's, uh, you know, they're unlikely to complain. And, you know, you just really got to be cognizant of, of what you're doing and, uh, make, and harm can happen. Uh, failure to match technology to the local needs. Um, so, you know, there's no point in teaching endoscopy to a population where there's no endoscopy. So I'm not going to teach Dr. Kiria how to do a robotic radical prostatectomy when, you know, there's no robot coming. <laughs> um, NGOs to cooperate and help each other. So sometimes there's competitive humanitarianism. We've talked about the follow-up plan. Um, allowing politics or training to distract tracking goals to Trump's service. So, you know, this is where we, you know, when we do bring residents, um, you know, they know they're there to teach, they know they're there to observe. And it's key that they know that, you know, obviously there's opportunities when they can help and pitch in, uh, but, but the, the priority is on uh, the local urologists and the local trainees. Uh, making sure we're going where we're not wanted or being poor guests. Um, and sometimes you, you know, doing the right thing for the wrong reason. So have a plan, know what you have to offer, know what your skill set is. Uh, take the time and the work to find the right opportunity. You might not accomplish much the first time. Sometimes it's getting to know people and, and understanding the system and, and understanding their needs. And then and that's why you go back again and again and again, assuming you're welcome, um, and and you build on that. Um, and con you know, consider what your objectives and your motives are, and make sure they're they're the right ones. Uh, prepare in advance. Uh, especially these days, there's no excuse for not preparing. You know, we can do Zoom calls, we can do WhatsApp, we can. There's no excuse for going in unprepared anymore. Know the roles and skill levels and the training of the host providers. You know, don't teach laparoscopy when they've never when it's not coming. Don't try and don't try and make sweeping changes thinking you know best because oftentimes you don't. Try and come back to the same place. Again, the medical tourism. You know, the idea is not to see different countries. The idea is to make a difference and teach. And then be open because you will learn a lot and your home practice will improve. Um, other good qualities for volunteers, be culturally sensitive, be flexible. If the power goes out, just, you know, it, it'll come back on. And the conditions, sometimes the conditions aren't as advertised, but you make do. And uh, again, flexibility is the key. Sometimes organization is, isn't what you hoped. And, uh, you know, the, the, the anesthetist may show up an hour or two late and just deal with it. And that means you stay a couple hours later that night. They're always willing to do that. Um, so patience, relax, be creative, you'll grow, uh, share your knowledge and skills and experience. And, and, and just because they're doing something differently doesn't mean it's wrong. Um, and just be humble and you'll have a successful partnership and friendship and, and you'll make a difference. So you want a sustainable project, build capacity, low impact, collaborate, recognize that unintended consequences can happen. You can mean well and bad things can happen. Um, and tra training is the most important thing and include 
ancillary staff. It's not always just about the doctors. You know, they have to make sure you're involving the staff from the people who are preparing the equipment, sets, nurses, ward staff, everybody. And that's it. Thanks, Eric. Fred, do you want to add or comment? <laughs> I must say, Eric has learned very well to outdo me. He has done it so well. And I've actually been taking notes. And everything that he has said has actually happened. And I like his concluding remarks that not everything they do is wrong. Yes, there are some things that are wrong, but maybe they work. And I must say, since we started working with Eric, indeed it is true, I used to do more open prostatectomies than I do now. In terms of percentages, I think of the prostatectomies that we do only one in 10 are open. The rest are endoscopic. And there is a ripple effect out of this one, that there is less morbidity. Two, there are less requirements for blood transfusion, which is in short supply. Three, there is, there is less hospital stay, which keeps our beds free to be used and again, to be used again and again by other patients. And then other institutions and students of urology are beginning to look our direction for training. We already have one who has applied for training. It's only that our patient numbers are not so high. The volume is not so high to offer that training, but just when we achieve that volume, that is adequate for training. I think with the help of Eric and other colleagues, we should be good to go. So it has been indeed a very fruitful collaboration between IVU and Mount Elgon Hospital where I work. And we even travel to Western Uganda and Fort Porto where we work every, every time Eric comes. And just before the advent of the, of the pandemic, we had a visiting team of urologists, of pediatric urologists, we worked with at Elgon and we have already established contact with them. And I want to believe that this collaboration will grow more and even more. Does anyone else have questions? And I'm very grateful that uh, through APE, the telepark, they donated the telepark to us and other equipment, which we are using very well. And we've had no problem with it. Eric, I thank you. I view, I'm very grateful. We thank you, Dr. Kiria. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and then soon, like I said, one of our residents, uh, Ross, uh, Anderson, I think he's, he, he did uh, his residency at Utah and then the fellowship at Utah. And I know his plan is to go back and, and hopefully share some of his reconstruction techniques and knowledge with, uh, with Dr. Curia and his colleagues. I know he's, I think he was all, I think he was supposed to go, right? I think he was supposed to go June of last year, right, Katie? I, I honestly don't remember, but. Yeah, but I think Ross was supposed left. to go. And then obviously the pandemic, you know, so, and uh, Tempe, who was pictured, who gave the lecture, you know, someday, you know, she'll go. And so that, and that, that's kind of the nice thing about the resident involvement and, and, and just keeping the partnership going and growing and, and building. I have a question for you, Dr. Sure. Richard. 
what, uh, what, what, what type of interaction involvement do you have um, with Dr. Curia and Dr. Curia, you can pipe in too if you have any insight um, other than the, the, the actual physical visits there. Uh, you know, the rest of the year, essentially, what are you doing um, with this partnership? Um, I would, so I would say that we communicate by email at least once a month you know, certainly leading up to a, a visit, then it's, you know, almost every couple of days. Um, the other things we're doing are, um, you know, there's, there's the lectures uh, that are being given. Um, and um, we do uh, WhatsApp calls, even video, just to visit as friends. <laughs> uh, I think one of the more recent ones, I think Dr. Curia got to see my kids because <laughs> I've met his. So uh, it, we, we stay involved. It's been a, I think the COVID thing has been gotten everybody a little bit more distracted, but, uh, you know, working on next steps and plans. And as I said, our goal is to get more people trained. Um, and if we can start doing that, you know, where, where the idea is, I just go and visit as a friend and <laughs> they don't need me anymore. I'm getting, I think it's getting close <laughs> where you don't need me anymore. So, as you said, like I said, he's doing, you know, 90% of his cases are now, you know, endo cases and uh, not just that, TURBTs and DVIU and also uh, urethroplasties. We've done a number of those together. Uh, and then, you know, we did some of the pediatric team, I think, in August of 2019 and plans to send a, re you know, now as his practice matures to send more advanced teams like reconstruction people and and, and I think uh, a, 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 um, a urologic oncologist too. Uh, what's his name again? Dr. Tichette was getting set up to go too. So, I, you know, that's kind of, I think probably my role going forward at court, you know, is knowing, is making the connections between other people that are appropriate for what his, his needs are and uh, advancing his knowledge and eventually getting to the point where you know, he's able to, you know, legitimately have a training center, which we're, we were really getting there. I think the COVID slowed us down by a bit, but, but we'll, we'll pick it back up. <laughs> yeah, great question, Colton. I was going to say, Dr. Richter, can you think of any example or an experience you've had volunteering has made a concrete change to your practice back in the U.S.? Sure. Um, you know, just again, a dealing, you know, just dealing with the uh, uh, poorly lit. Uh, well, actually, no, I'm going to actually say it differently. Actually, a different technique, even just with urethroplasties um, that I do now. Dr. Curia taught me this. Basically, I, he puts his sound in through the, from a super pubic tract that I hadn't been doing before. And I didn't now use that to actually, actually put my sutures in. So there's actually, so I think actually I should, there's actually been surgical techniques that I've used um, that I've learned from him. More of the open stuff, especially. <laughs> He's a far superior open surgeon than I am. Um, but you know, then there's also just the you know, and the, and the and not to sound like whatever, but the nurses at the hospital I work with, they they comment that oh, you never get bent out of shape when things aren't going the right way. And it's you know, some of that's probably a little bit pre-existing, but some of that's also you kind of learn that a it doesn't accomplish much, but b you learn learn to, you you can adapt and overcome. If you can do these cases there successfully, you know, take a deep breath, it'll get fixed, and and there's no reason to uh, make a ruckus. But yeah, there's been that's that's certainly an open circle. But there's a couple others that I used. Uh, that I've used too. That you know, things I've learned in Uganda. That, um, but definitely the the use of the the sound and the in the in the urethra coming from the super pubic tract. Um, that's helped. God, I'm, trying, I'm drawing a blank on another one that I think that I, that I literally use all the time. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, there's been some surgical techniques that I've learned, and then just also just kind of a comfort level that uh, that you develop that if you can. If you can operate in uh, in Uganda, you can 
to overcome things here in the United States for just, and you, and you, and you just appreciate the things you have, you know, you know, just knowing like, wow, we are truly blessed. Yeah. But they're blessed too. They, they, they have other blessings we don't have. <laughs> I have a story to tell that's trending in the country today. Uh, my colleague, Joseph, the urologist, uh, seven days ago, separated Siamese twins at Sorot Hospital, where there is barely in a high dependency unit or ICU. And the story goes that this lady went into labor in a village about 70 kilometers off Soroti, and she had this cesarean section where Siamese twins were delivered, female Siamese twins, Thoracopagus. And when they arrived at Soroti Hospital, one was alive and one was dead. And they were referred to the National Referral Hospital in Kampala called Mulago. And the doctors there then thought uh, uh, this, the living twin would not survive. The condition wasn't compatible with life. And they referred the living twin attached to the dead twin back to her village. The parents decided to get back to Soroti Hospital. And after two days of preparation, Joseph consulted me and we thought he could attempt the surgery. I told him, okay, when you're ready, get to me. Then I went into a meeting. He started the surgery and separated the Siamese twins, the dead from the living. And they shared the left lobe of the liver. So he did a, a partial hepatectomy, resected off the rib cage of the dead and sutured the skin defects back. And the second twin is now seven days post-op and she's doing well. In recognition of that, one would say heroic maneuver of the team, the parliament in Uganda has called Joseph and his team to parliament tomorrow for recognition. So he's preparing to travel tonight. I joined the rest of the world in congratulating them. This has not been done in Uganda before. And according to international literature, such a twin has rarely survived when the, the other conjoint twin has passed on. So it is something great for the region. And we do hope that the country will use this as an example to improve on surgical services up country and in small places where we work and teach like in Eastern Uganda. So that is the news trending. Wow. I thank you for listening to me. It's exciting. Joseph is, he, yeah, Joseph is another one that I consider a friend and, and it doesn't surprise me. He's, he's amazing. <laughs> Pass on my congratulations. I'll probably, yeah, I will. I'll, thank I'll you. I'll probably contact him anyway. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> Let's see, it's somewhere in here. I think that's probably all the time we have because everyone committed for an hour, but thank you so much for presenting and thank you to everyone who came. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks thank for making the time. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Talk soon, Fred. <laughs>